invitation to come to this very nice campus. Um, so today, the talk will, will be about the number of F matchings in a tree, uh, of course, and there are two parts. Mostly we will be looking at inverse problems, and then towards the end we will look at the extremal side of this um, number of F matchings. Okay, so what exactly do I mean by inverse problems? So actually, okay, does it work? Mm -hmm. Maybe this way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey. It was working. It's many times and maybe. Yeah, oh. it's working. Okay. So inverse problem is, yeah. Um, so take your favorite graph parameter and take your favorite class of graphs, then you can compute this graph parameter. So that's one way. And then inverse problem is, of course, about the inverse. The, to, to look for the inverse image of some element in this x, this set x. So for example, we can think of f as computing the degree sequence of a graph in G. And then, and then so we will get some partition of an integer. So in particular, if we have a partition of 2n minus 2, this integer, into n parts, then this sequence, we can always realize it as the degree sequence of um, a tree. So, so, so we will be interested in the cases whether this f inverse image of x, is it empty or um, how large is it in terms of um, the number of f matchings. So, but then f matching started with independent sets. Actually, the story is about independent sets. So, of course, as you know, an independent set is a set of vertexes which does not induce any edge. And then we denote the number by i of g. So, this was first introduced in the 1980s by Prodinger and Tichy, who um, proved extremal results on trees. In, in, uh, on this uh, parameter, and he showed that for trees of order n, the maximum is attained by the star and the minimum by the path. So, or, or maybe, so in order to get some feeling, so to get an independent set of a star, then either we do not use this one. Then there are n minus one vertexes of which we can make an independent choice. So then that gives us two to the n minus one. And then if we pick the center, then we cannot pick any of the leaf, right? And for the path, either we do not use the use a leaf, and then we have i p n minus one, or we use this leaf, then we cannot use this one, and it's i p n minus two. So, so right. And this is also studied in other contexts. OK, so if we want to invert the number of independent sets, then it's quite easy if we are allowed to use any graph. Because um, that for the click, is just the order plus one. So all the singletons and the anti sets. So we can write any positive integer as i of g, as i of k. Then if we restrict ourselves to the bipartite graph, then it's already a little bit tricky. And in 1989, Linac proved that we can always do that. I mean, uh, a bipartite graph can have any number of in, uh, independent sets. And there he made this rather strange conjecture but is it still open? Whether it's true that we can further restrict ourselves to trees. And of course, it's not true that any integer can be expressed as i of t because for, for example, so again to get some feeling. So the number of independent set of of a one vertex tree is two, and this is three. 
then this is one, two, three, the empty set, and then the first and the third. So four is already skipped. So, um, yeah. As far as I know, it is still open, and uh, nobody seems to be doing anything about it. Um, but for the moment, we will drop this problem, and uh, or at least in this version, we will drop it down. But instead, we will look at an interesting result by Wagner, who says that if you fix an integer m, positive integer, then almost every unlabeled tree has it a multiple of m. So by that, of course, I mean um, if you look at all the unlabeled trees on n vertexes, and then we take away all the vertexes. So here, these are the um, trees of all the n, and this is zero mod m. And this thing tends to zero as n tends to infinity. So yeah. So it's getting, um, or it, most of them has zero residue as the as it. So the combinatorial part of the argument is to show that we have some root tree, tt, such that both it and if we delete the root, they are both a multiple of m. And then the rest is by singularity analysis to um, to find. Um, some easier generating functions to dominate the generating function of this guy and to consider the radius of convergence. And there he asks this question, sort of like an, uh, inverting the residue classes as i of t. What about the other residue classes? Do we get any tree at all? Well, actually, we do. And so for any residue class modulo m, we can always find such a tree. And in fact, we can even require that this tree has maximum degree free. So the idea is to actually to forget about the tree and, and then to reformulate the problem as a number theoretic problem and then try to solve it. It's very simple, but uh, we won't do it now. But in a sense, Singularity analysis or using generating function is not that, um, it's a little bit mysterious. So it's uh, always better to have a more explicit explanation. And driven by that, Alon, Heb Harbor, and Clifford Fish, they put the, it, uh, put the problem in a more general setting and consider F matchings. So uh, F matching is just a collection of this, uh, just a collection of disjoint copies of f. So when, for example, when f is k two, then this is just the usual matching, where we look at independent set, uh, independent edges. Then, an induced f matching would be that outside these copies of f, we do not induce any other edge. So, so this would of course be a, a matching, these two edges, but they wouldn't be a, an induced matching because the center edge will also be induced. And we would mostly look at F matching, but just that to put it in the bigger context, induced matching, so um, uh, so that we know that it's actually really generalizing um, independent sets because an induced K1 matching is an independent set. Okay. So what he what they did was to show that if you fix an integer m and some tree f with at least one 
one edge, then almost every labeled tree has this number of match f matching a multiple of m. So the idea is to say that um, there is a tree at h that this is fixed such that whenever this h um, occurs in a tree as a limb, then this sft is a multiple of m. So what does it mean by limb? So maybe this is a tree t, and then you have got some part here, and and this thing, if this if if this thing is uh, is h, then we say that h occurs as a limb. So h is um, consists of a number of branches at the vertex at of t. So I mean there are no more no more things going out that are not in H. We do not allow that. So they are just branches. But we are we, we may have more than one branch. Yeah. So that is H occurring as a limb. And then they show that almost every label tree contains H as a limb. Then combining these two, then they get their result. So for the second part, they use concentration of measures, but again, one can use also generating functions to get around it. Okay. And then what about the other residue classes? Just a, a question very similar to what Wagner asked. Well, we can do it. And this is a quite a nice construction that I would like to describe it in more details. That every residue class, we can realize it as the number of F matchings. So we will concentrate on the case that the diameter of F is at least 3. So it's not just a star. So then f may be, okay, then we take um, a longest path um, then, so this is, this would be uh, f, something like this, u0, ud, maybe there are, so this is a longer path. Maybe there are maybe some more edges hanging off. This is f. And we define d as f minus one of the ends. So then we have d. Huh? Yeah, we did it d. The only difference is d. Then we define W by identifying, by gluing K copies of F and some constant M minus K copies of uh, D at U0. So that means we would have something like u0 here, and we will have some branch that looks like d. We will have k of them, and then we have some. Oh, maybe this, this, this. Um, some m minus k branches of d. So we don't know m yet. M is just some number depending on M. Okay, so now then let's look at, so why do I construct this tree? So this is W. Well, because counting the number of F matching is a little bit, uh, is harder than counting the number of copies of F. 
So I construct this W so that actually there are no disjoint copies of F. So I said, so we count, we, we make some observations. So first of all, any copy of F contains U0. Why? Because if we delete U0, then all these components are just too small to accommodate a copy. And then exactly k copies contain uh, exactly one edge. So if it contain an edge at u0, then it must be these branches. The rest, again, they are too small. So then the trick comes when we consider those having two edges, at least two edges at u0. So these copies then actually, maybe they look like this one. So maybe this is a, a, a copy of F. Well, this copy actually cannot go all the way down to, to uh, level D. Because if this copy contains such a vertex, then it also has to contain U0. And it contains a path from down up there, down there, all the way up to U0, then it it is a path of length d. And if it has one more edge going out, then we will have a path too long. So such copy has to leave lies within distance from u0. Right? It just can't go out. But then from the vantage point of U0, you look around, all the M branches, they are the same. So in order to form a copy of F0, of F, then what we need is to choose some branches out of M branches. Then the number of such copies is just a sum of binomial coefficients of this type for some L and then bounded by the maximum number of maximal degree of F. Right? Okay, so now it's clear what we should choose. We should pick M such that you don't have to count any of this. So for example one way would be ah, maybe this as long as we have this m then all these are congruent to zero mod m so we don't have to worry about that and and the result would be that sfw is just k plus one and by varying k, then we, we will get our result. This is a very simple construction, and uh, so if you want to see some more details, but I guess they are all there. So now we know that we can invert every residue class. But how many of them are there? Do we have only a very small amount. We know that the majority lies in the residue class of zero, but what about the rest? Do they still grow or do they yeah, sort of just die out with no trace at all? So actually, they still grow exponentially. Um, so what we need here
is so we want to construct many trees inside uh, a particular residue class well one reduction is to reduce k just to one so there is some trick some other construction to reduce it but so let's just focus on the case where k is one our aim is to construct a router tree R such that whenever we join it to some so we'll call this guy T um, so all these things they lie in the residue, uh, they lie in the congruence class 1. We want that uh, S F of T is also in 1. Um, so, so our aim is to construct R such that this one would imply okay so why is that helpful um, because then then this class of trees having the f the number of f matchings congruent to 1 would uh, amidst this uh, uh, description so this is the class of okay maybe let's, no, let's use T these are the trees with um, SFT I'm going to run then this would admit a, this description that it is just some R, this tree R, together with a collection of trees also within this class. Or in other words, we can say that is this root together with a multiset of the same of trees of this class. So this symbolic equation can be translated into generating functions and that would be that guy that would this is my s so And then what we need is to show that the radius of conversions of S is smaller than 1. When it happens, then we can use maybe Kochi Hadamard's formula or Kochi integration formula, etc., to show that actually the coefficients grow faster than exp uh, grows exponentially. So then our job is to find this R. But how do we find it? So, so what properties do we want? So we want this property. So one way to ensure that we have this implication um, is that this R oh, so it's SF R is okay maybe let's just compute this and it's and it's clear rather what do we need so to compute SFT then we consider whether we use these edges or not so suppose we do not use all these edges let's call this guy H these are the formed by these copies of H together with the root so suppose we do not use any of these edges 
then it will be the same as SFR times, because we are looking at matchings, times SFH uh, H minus R, sorry. And then now suppose we use some of these edges. Then for R, R cannot use any F matching in R cannot use this root. Uh, then plus S F R minus R um, times So if you use these edges, then R cannot use R, but then H, it must use its root. So this is all the F matchings. Then we take away all the F matchings that do not use the root. So remember that all, by assumption, all these guys multiply to 1. and in order to, one way to get this is to ask for this is 1 and to ask for that this is 0 then we would ensure that SFT is congruent to 1 and then we would be able to use generating functions to conclude that they still grow exponentially. Any questions? Uh, the, 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 the construction, the explicit construction is rather technical, so um, I won't do it here, but if you're interested, you can talk about it later. So this is the, the algebraic formula. So you're writing the generating function. Um, no. This equation. No, this is just to compute oh, SFT. Yeah. Uh, okay. So these are we are separating we are separating the cases where we use any of these edges. So the okay. in the first case is that we don't use any of this edge. Then we have separated. Then the first factor comes from above. Then the second factor comes from. So this is also actually the the product of P. Uh -huh. So these are, we are counting matchings that do not use any of these edges. Okay, then for the next, we count that the matchings, those matchings that use some of these edges. But then, if a matching uses these edges, then it cannot, um, those edges, that, those copies in R cannot use the root R. But then for H, they must use the root. And the property that we ask our R to satisfy is that SFR is congruent to 1, but then SFR minus R is congruent to 0. With these properties satisfied, then we will ensure that this R, when joined to any collection, we stay inside the class. And once we have this property, then we can write this equation. And then the translation into generating function is this one. Then what we need is to check that this has radius of convergence smaller than 1. And that, I think, is a little bit uh, technical, so I won't do it here. Okay, so there are some more generalizations of, along this theme. Um, using the basic construction that we had, which is that we can control the number of matchings and the number of induced matchings simultaneously. So this is the number of induced matching.
that one, yeah, that we can also control. Um, another direction of generalization is that we consider a collection of trees, not just one, but that we, we assume some non embeddability condition, which is that no one can be contained in another. Then we can always realize any sequence of integers as the sequence of number of fi matchings. So by that I mean if we take some k1, k2 up to kr, some, some integers, then there exists a tree, t, such that um, s f i t is k i. Uh, yeah, it's just a uh, variation of the theme. Mm -hmm. But the second theorem is about the FI matching, not induced matching. Right, just uh, F matching, not induced. So there are general, I mean, there are natural questions to ask for whether um, we can just drop uh, this non embeddability condition. And yeah, for that I don't know the answer, but I suspect probably no. But yeah, right. Okay, so remember in Alon, what they proved is that almost every labeled tree contains H as a limb. And what about unlabeled trees? Um, Actually, for unlabeled tree, that is still that also that is true, and that is a theorem by Schrank in 1973, who showed that for any given fixed tree H, then almost every unlabeled tree contains H as a limb. So his interest was in relation to characteristic polynomial. I mean, so in the sort of in the early days of graph theory. Or, well, by that I mean maybe 60s, <laughs> 50s, 70s. Um, so people look at the graph and then look at its adjacency matrix and then compute the characteristic polynomial. So it was once asked whether by looking at the characteristic polynomial we can find the graph. And there are many results on this form, uh, uh, in this form. So, but Schwang proved that, um, so he found some rooted trees A and B, such that whenever A occurs, oh, maybe let's not make it so complicated, I cannot repeat it. such that when A occurs in T as a limb, and if we swap A and B, then they have the same characteristic polynomial. Or because characteristic polynomial calculates the eigenvalue, so they are also called co-spectral. Because then we can pick this as H. Almost every tree contains this A as a limb, and so we can sw swap it with B. So the conclusion is that most trees we can, um, it's not determined by the characteristic polynomial we can, because we can just swap it and then get something else. And so now. It's quite interesting to note that the characteristic polynomial actually it carries the same information as the matching polynomial. So by matching polynomial I mean just 
enumerate all the matchings with an indeterminate set where the power is, yeah, how many edges are, are there in this matching. And more generally, we can replace this K2 by F to get F matching polynomial. So, and one question is, ah, so actually, it's, we, 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 we said that we can flip it and then get another one, but we can also sh show that most of them, actually, they, they share its characteristic polynomial with a very large class. So, the question that I was getting to is that if you have general F, so for some general F, not just an edge, are there such trees that we can swap without affecting the F matching polynomial? Okay. Yeah, I mean for for specific F, probably we can do it, but yeah, for general um, a swapping construction might not be so easy. Okay. So ah, now we return to the extremal side. Okay. So because F matching is quite a new parameter, so we can all ask different extremal questions. And most of them are unknown. So first of all, given a treat F, we define this mu Fn to be the maximal number of F matchings among trees of order N. And so what happens if F is just an edge? Then we are again thinking of just ordinary matching. Then what is mu Fn? So, so which one maximizes the number of matchings? Any guess? So, well, we, we prove it by induction, actually, that actually the path maximizes the number of matchings. So, um, an SK2T is the same as, again, we look at matchings that do not use phi, and this is T minus phi. And then we look at matching set to use phi, but if I use phi, then I cannot use u. So induction, of course, starts with paths. So then this is this is a tree of a, of order n minus one, and then this is a forest of order n minus two. But then we, of course, a forest is not as um, <coughs> good as a path, as a, as a tree. So then we get this. Very simple argument. And in fact, this is straight if t is not a path. Yeah. We can check. OK. Or more generally, um, so then what, what about other Fs? Or even more generally, we look at FR matchings, where we require that not only that they, so in the induced case, we require that there is some intermediate vertex to separate them. So it's saying that the distance of two copies have distance at least two. So what about if we are required that they have to uh, they don't don't push too close. And yeah, so then what about this mu F R N? So 
we have seen that Tichy proved that for a tree, the star maximizes the independent set and the matching uh, and the path uh, minimizes the number of independent sets. So then the next open case is for K2 for induced matching. I mean the, the smallest the smallest other open case is for is to find these things. So actually for induced matching it's not too hard but again it's if you don't have time to do that, that is actually the positive zero of this e polynomial. Ah, no, so that is for n. Right. Before that, we normalize, we, we, we do not actually care the exact value, but then we just want to know um, to avoid number theoretic difficulties whether f defies t or not the order of f device, the order of t or not. So just look at the growth rate. Um, we look at this mu fr as the nth root, as the limit of the nth root of mu fr n. Um, so this limit actually exists because this function is, a, is in a sense rather like a sub-multiplicative function and by fixed lemma then the limit exists and yeah then we can find that this mu k2 2 is the positive zero there right or now something like an inverse problem is to ask in the set of real numbers between 1 and 2, so which real number can be realized as the growth rate of FR matchings? Or, um, so note that this mu, F, mu FR, this growth rate, is always bigger than 1, but then if we fix F and then increase R, then this will be a sequence tending to 1. So 1 will be an accumulation point there. So are there any other accumula accumulation points? Or are there gaps? So these some open problems for you. I'm confused. Um, mu fr is different from mu fn. Right, <laughs> that's a bad notation. You are, this absolutely, you are absolutely correct. Yeah. So, maybe I should, yeah. Then let's not use uh, mu uh, m. Okay. You are absolutely right. Thank you very much. So another way of generalizing or asking these kind of density questions or um, this growth question is to consider densities. So for a finite graph G, the independent set density is defined as IG divided by 2 to the mod G, which is the same as the probability of a randomly chosen set is independent is this uh, identity IDG and Bonato and his co-authors they prove that <coughs> the closure of this independent density even for G is when G is infinite but countably infinite is a subset of uh, rational numbers within 0 and 1 so what does it mean that when G is infinite to consider uh, ID of G, so 
you can think of it as you mean proper subset or or no, no oh, I see yeah. so I, I was I wasn't right. sure about the point of this I mean it's always the general one yeah but then G need maybe infinite when it's infinite then maybe it goes a little bit to the irrational side so for so for so they consider a chain of uh, induced subgraphs, but actually so you consider a chain of induced subgraphs, and then and then they took G as the union of this, and they first show that. So this particular chain, this limit exists. And then for another chain, they show that actually the same limit is there. You can think of it as, um, so we have some chain going to G, and some other chain also going to G. But if the limit of the identity density, if they differ, then because eventually you will get some graph cl close to this limit and eventually you will get some graph close to the other limit but then because they are finite so eventually this is contained in some finite graph more uh, downstream and then that has to be close to L1 and similarly this one has to be close to that L2. So L1 and L2 actually they are the same. So for F matchings, then maybe one way to normalize it is to, yeah, instead of normalizing to the, the G, but we pick um, uh, all the F minus one uh, subsets of the edges. Then, what is this set? Can we have? Can we say something about it? Are there gaps? Are there accumulation points? Right. I think. Uh, yeah. These are some open problems for you, and and for the, and with that, I end the talk. Thank you.